Thank you for coming out on this ashy Wednesday evening. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Stephanie Sirkovich. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Seattle. County, uh, and it's an honor to welcome you to the first of several election forums organized by the League of Women Voters. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Barbara Chevalier and Bridget Krushka, the League's Voter Services Chairs, and all of the volunteers who work so hard to put this event together tonight. Um, they work really hard, and I think this is a great venue, and we're very happy that you all came out to Bellevue. I'd also like to thank our candidates for taking time out of your very grueling schedule to be here. Um, it is truly a sacrifice and a commitment to run for office, and we really appreciate your dedication to our community. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to encouraging informed and active participation in government. While we don't endorse candidates running for office, we do think it's important to hear from them, which is why we sponsor these forums. So in addition to tonight's event, we'll be hosting forums for the 45th and 48th District Senate races on September 18th, the Seattle School Board on October 4th, and a special forum for a Seattle City Council and mayoral candidates on October 5th. So please visit our website at seattlelwv.org for more information and to become a member and join us. Uh, right now, as you can imagine, we're in the throes of election season with a lot of great election-related events coming up in addition to our forums. We're doing a lot of voter registration drives. We're promoting vote411.org, which is a one-stop shop website for nonpartisan election information tailored to your, uh, tailored to your address. Um, and we're coming up on ballots and baristas which is a series of community conversations about ballot measures that we put together in partnership with Starbucks. Um, and that's coming up in October. Outside of election season, we also hold monthly forums that are free to the public on a wide variety of issues. Everything from the environment to transportation to social justice. So if you're interested in getting involved, please feel free to talk to me. You can also go talk to Allison in the back of the room there She's waving hi. And there's a table back there with more information. And again, our website is seattlelwv.org. Um, tonight, we'll be hearing from candidates running for the King County Sheriff's Office and the Port of Seattle Commission. So on the face of it, these offices may not seem to have a lot in common. But whether they're protecting the public or safeguarding our economic agenda, these are all keepers of the public's trust who protect the well-being and health of our community. So to introduce these candidates to you, we are very fortunate to have Simone Alisea from KNKX 88.5 FM here to moderate this evening. And I'm just going to read to you a little bit about Simone. A Seattle native and former KNKX intern, Simone Alisea received her bachelor's degree in journalism from Northwestern University and covered breaking news at the Chicago Sun-Times. She also spent time as an undergraduate covering Metro News in Cape Town, South Africa for the Cape Times. Please join me in welcoming Simone. Thanks. All right, good evening. Everyone can hear me okay? Wonderful. Um, so as we said, we're doing two positions, or two races today. We have the King County Sheriff. We're gonna start with the King County Sheriff's Office. Um, before we get into the stuff you really want to hear, I want to lay down some ground rules. First, if you have any device that makes noise, if you could turn that noise off. Um, you're allowed to take photos, but if you, you don't want to have any flash or anything that's clicking or things that are going to distract the candidates or the people around you from getting the information that they really want. Um, after this point, if you could save all applause, we want to, again, we want to make sure everyone is getting informed. So we're going to, no applause, no cheering or booing um, until we get to the very, very end and we've concluded and everyone's excited. Um, if I see people misbehaving or if, God forbid, candidates are misbehaving, um, it will be my discretion to um, you know, let them know or possibly have that person escorted out. I'm sure we won't have a problem tonight, but I... <laughs> Remember, the sheriff's here. Um, so the way this will go is I have a couple questions that I'm going to start with. At any point, if you have a question that you think is you want me to ask, 
Um, raise your hand. I think there are note cards. Either you have, okay, people have them. If you don't have them, someone will get one to you. Write down your question, raise it up in the air, someone will grab it and give it to me. Um, and I will try to take a few, at least a few um, questions from the audience. Um, the format of this, um, because we have a number of people to get through today, we're not gonna do opening or closing statements. Um, the questions are also gonna be timed. I'll let candidates know how much time you'll have for each question. Um, the other thing is that candidates will be able, will have one challenge for the duration of the forum. What that is is these, I think those are the wooden paddles there. If <laughs> nothing untoward is happening, I promise. Um, basically, uh, if uh, a candidate um, says something that their opponent disagrees with, they can raise that paddle they'll have 45 seconds to state their challenge, um, and then the other candidate will have 45 seconds to respond. Again, each candidate only gets one for the duration of the forum, so use, use it wisely. Oh, sorry, a little bit of feedback here. Um, without further ado, I think we'll get into uh, what everyone came here for, um, and we'll uh, hear from the county sheriffs. Um, Running for the sheriff's office, we have incumbent John Urquhart, um, and we have uh, Mitzi Jo Hanknick, um, and our, we'll switch off on the order of, of answering questions. Um, to begin, could each of you please take one minute to tell us why you're running for King County Sheriff, and we'll start with John Urquhart. Well, I've been sheriff for the last four and a half years. And I'm running because I'm very pleased with what we've accomplished over the last four years. I've returned accountability and transparency to the Sheriff's Office, which is what I promised to do when I ran uh, in 2012. I've been able to diversify the Sheriff's Office. I want to make sure that that continues. I've saved the taxpayers money. In fact, I've saved them $5 million over the last four years of money returned to the general fund that I didn't spend because I managed the Sheriff's Office budget never went back to the county council for more, more money because we overspent uh, primarily in overtime is where it hits most often. Uh, I've, uh, going forward, I want body cameras. I think the public is demanding body cameras. Body cameras are gonna level the playing field. I want additional training for my deputies. Uh, we don't have enough training. I've secured uh, $800,000 know, for the rest of this year for training alone. So uh, those are things I wanna do going forward. That's why I'm running. Thank you, um, appreciate y'all being here. So what's different about me? I'm a compassionate, ethical leader. I believe in bringing back uh, honor and integrity to the office of sheriff. There are changes that need to be done. We need to stop waste. Over the last five years, there's been $20 million of waste, $6.5 million wasted on record management system. Five million returned to uh, return to the King County General Fund that was meant for deputies. Five point five million dollars in overpayment to deputies, which was not their fault. They had uh, mentioned it in 2012. Three point five million dollars in lawsuits, and there's still four lawsuits pending, and another 1.5 million that was returned that was intended for training and crisis intervention training. So there's other changes I want to bring to the department bring back our focus to public safety and making sure that we work with the community and have a plan to build strategic plans and business plans so that we don't waste any money. All right, um, we'll start with candidate Johanknik for this next question. What are the three most pressing issues facing King County in the next five years? Of those issues, which is the single most critical, and as sheriff, what action or change do you propose to positively affect that issue? Each candidate will have three minutes to answer this question. Go ahead. So the first challenge, and will end up being the greatest challenge, is restoring the erosion of community trust in public safety. Uh, the second thing we need to do is change and the culture within the organization so that they feel safe to be involved and, and, and included in 
the decision making up and down the department right now, there's fear and vin for vindictiveness from leadership in the organization. Uh, the, th the third thing is making sure that we get good training for our deputies that helps us reduce um, and deal with use of force situations and that we provide our deputies with less lethal options that we don't currently have deployed to them but are available for use. So those are the three things. The main, the main focus, as I stated, is the erosion of trust uh, with the public in law. Do we lose? Can we pause the clock real quick? Is there? Or do you guys? Oh, I think it's actually on. So go ahead and project into the microphone if you would. Sorry. So there is that better? That's okay. wonderful. Apologies. So uh, to restore the faith in the sheriff's office, I. I walk the walk and talk the talk, and our leadership that is selected into positions within the organization need to do the same. We need to have folks that interact with the community, and we set up in a community outreach group that does this effectively, and that what I'm hearing as I go out to all these meetings is the community wanting to be involved in how we rebuild that trust. And so I'm looking at having community advisory councils that bring in and include people from all ethnicities and build faith back in their police department through that process. Well, I don't think we've lost the trust of the community. Of the three challenges that we are facing over the next four years, next turn, the most important one is maintaining that trust because trust in a police department is a fragile thing. And it's how we maintain that that's going to be absolutely critical. It's the, it's the trust that really matters. We've gone, I've gone to well over 100 community meetings in the last four years, at least 100, in all different parts of King County. And I know where that trust is. We do, we maintain that trust by being accountable to the community by letting them know that I won't tolerate officer misconduct. I'm not gonna look the other way. I'm gonna handle it. I'm gonna make sure that there is no blue wall anymore in the sheriff's office. It's still there, but I'm, I intend to eradicate it going forward. Secondly, I think the, the uh, next biggest issue has gotta be training. The state of Washington requires 20, 20, hours, 20 hours of training every single year for a police officer. Only 20 hours, that's not nearly enough. I'm gonna at least double that. I want de-escalation training. I want crisis intervention training. The standard is eight hours. The state requires eight hours of new officers. The gold standard is 40 hours of crisis intervention training. So we can deal with people that are mentally ill, that are in mental crisis, before we have to resort to deadly force. I expect every single deputy by the end of 2018 to have 40 hours of CIT training, crisis intervention training. No other department in the state is going to be up at that level. Absolutely critical. We've got a three-day in-service training coming up this year. That I got Dow Constantine to fund, giving us the money last year for training this year. That will involve not only de-escalation, but racial bias training, implicit bias training, so officers will know and be able to recognize their implicit biases that all of us have, including police officers. That's going to help maintain the trust of the community as well. And de-escalation is absolutely critical. That's how we walk away from certain incidences. We have to train our officers just to walk away. We have to give them the tools as well. We have to give them the tools such as tasers and pepper spray that they're all required to carry with them. Since I've been sheriff, that was a change that I made. I'm going to get them beanbag shotguns as well. Somebody asked me what a beanbag shotgun was at a community meeting. It's a shotgun that fires beanbags, but it allows us to stay farther away from somebody and reduce the risk before we have to result to deadly force. So those are the, the biggest challenges that we are facing going forward. Okay.
candidate Johanneknik, you have a challenge. You have 45 seconds to state your challenge. Thank you. Uh, my challenge is there's been five years to get those things done. I was the first law enforcement officer after the Black Law Enforcement Association to come out in support of Initiative 940, which is known as the de-escalation initiative. Um, it includes that training, it mandates that training. There was nothing stopping the King County Sheriff's Office from doing the training that my opponent just spoke to five years ago. And five years ago, there was a park report that said we needed to bring less lethal options into the organization and, and expand them, meaning the beanbag shotguns. And we should have done it, and we haven't done it yet, and I don't know how we're going to get there. 45 seconds to respond. We've done de-escalation training every single year, every single year in our taser recertification. So that's just not true. In 2013, one of my deputies shot and killed somebody. He had a taser that didn't work. He didn't have any pepper spray on his belt because he wasn't required to carry pepper spray. He is now. Every single deputy in my department carries two less than lethal options on their belt. Unlike the Seattle Police Department, that's because I mandated it. We didn't have de-escalation requirements in our policy until we, I became sheriff. Now, every single officer is required to document their de-escalation techniques that they used before they resorted to force. There's been lots of changes that have gone on in those areas, in that arena, since I've been sheriff. Uh, moving right along, um, candidate Johanknik, you mentioned Initiative 940. Both of you have endorsed uh, the proposed state Initiative 940. This is initiative. This is an initiative that would alter police training requirements and the standard for justifiable use of deadly force by law enforcement. Um, could each of you speak for a moment about why you think those changes are necessary and what changes you would implement within the department if that initiative fails? Um, sure. Start. Because the initiative 940 does not mandate a changes yeah. in use of force for the sheriff's office, or for any police department for that matter. Really what it does, the most important thing it does, it removes the term malice from state law when it comes to deadly force used by police officers. And it's important to have that out of there because it basically prohibits prosecutors from charging police officers in a misuse of deadly force and deadly force only. We are probably the only state in the union that has malice in their state law. Dan Satterberg, basically every single prosecutor in the state says, we can't charge police officers because of that. So when this, when this initiative was filed, they also included extra training for police officers in de-escalation techniques, which is fine and will help, it, help that make the ballot. They also included a section in there that uh, mandates first aid after we do use force which my deputies are doing anyway, and we've trained them how to do that first aid. In fact, we just used it and saved a man's life here less than a week ago because of the first aid that my deputies applied. So it doesn't change anything. If it doesn't fail, we are already training our deputies to the same level, whether there's malice in state law or not. This is not a police issue. This is a prosecutorial issue. But I supported it. I'm the only police chief or sheriff in the state of Washington at this minute that has endorsed 940. And I endorsed it the day after she did. It has nothing to do with the fact that she did. I just had an event that I went to, and I wanted to make sure I got it out at that event. So the community understood, because it was a community of color. So the community understood where I, where I stood, <laughs> understands where I stood on that issue. So it's very, very, it's from, a, from a community acceptance standpoint, it's critical that 940 passes. And if you haven't signed it, I urge all of you to sign 940, that initiative, so we can get it on the ballot. Well, you've had the uh, introduction to the, uh, my support of it is because in this day and age, and society and the communities uh, demand to hold us accountable when we do something wrong, when we break the law, that taking of malice out of the, uh, out of the law currently is huge in helping prosecute and have a su successful prosecution of anybody that uh, has broken the law. So that'll be great for, for prosecutions across the state. 
and we all should be held accountable if we violate the law in that manner. The other two parts of it are, uh, it adds a subjective and objective test to the process, which means that uh, they, the review of the use of force can be used through the eyes of a deputy with comparable timing or training and experience. So that um, that's a much easier standard to determine whether or not the use of force was appropriate or whether or not somebody should be charged for that use of force. So um, I'm a big supporter. Uh, I've been able to work with the policy committee and I intend to work on the, with the policy committee for the initiative group moving forward was invited to do that uh, uh, before I uh, went ahead and endorsed it because I wanted to find out what was truly in the initiative, how it would affect law enforcement. And it, and it will impact potentially how we do training um, and, and how we change, might need to change some policy around. But that would be for the good and for, for better process and documentation internally in the sheriff's office. All right. Um, so you talk about internally in the sheriff's office. It's a public facing office. Um, and how can King County law enforcement best increase their transparency and accountability to citizens? Uh, candidate John Heignick, let's start. Each of you will have two minutes. find the right side of this, there we go. Um, so I believe we need to be more transparent in how we do investigations into officers using force or, or uh, violating a policy or law. I, my position is that the rank of sheriff and their appointed can be overseen by civilian oversight. We currently have an Office of Law Enforcement Oversight that looks at all the complaint investigations that come through. And I think that office should also, or the Ombudsman's Office, should the sheriff's position as well as the sheriff's appointed. Now my opponent might say that that's a labor. It's not. It, this would run concurrently with any investigation done in an internal investigation process. So the best way to make sure I'm doing the right job for you as sheriff is that you have complete transparency through an independent group looking at what I may have done wrong or what my appointments may have done wrong. And through that process, if need be, and it's a bad enough complaint, I should put myself straight straight of leave. The Sheriff's Office has an Office of Law Enforcement Oversight, which is civilian oversight of the Sheriff's Office, something I've been very supportive of. I worked very closely with the director. About six months ago, I went to her and I said, I would like you to take over all the investigations of allegations against command staff. So that is captains and above. I think that will get it out of the detective sergeant that does that investigation. She's not able to do that yet. And that's what she wants to do. That's what I think needs to happen. And that was my suggestion. My other suggestion was that we take officer-involved shootings and we get the legislature to fund a unit inside the state patrol, inside Washington State Patrol or in the Attorney General's office that investigates every single officer-involved shooting in the state of Washington. That will get them out of us investigating ourselves and will create more transparency and increase the confidence of the public that we're not investigating ourselves. No other police chief, no other sh sheriff has ever suggested this before. It's going to cost money. The legislature is going to have to fund it. That's where we are headed in this state. That absolutely needs to happen. Until that does happen, we can still be transparent. I think the Seattle Police Department is a great example. When they have video, they release that video right away. I don't have much video because I don't have body cameras yet, but that's what we need to do. When we have an officer-involved shooting that's a fatality, I send that investigation to the FBI when it's completed. 
I want the FBI to look at it. I want to. I want their their eyes on it. I want the U.S. Attorney to take a look at it, regardless of what we came up with. Again, that is transparency, and that's accountability at the same time, and that can happen inside the sheriff's office. We need to be the leaders on that. Um, one more question about sort of the department. Um, and the way it's run and the department in general. Uh, one of the goals, um, stated goals of the King County Sheriff's Department is to increase diversity, including gender diversity in the workplace. Um, what specific steps would you take toward achieving that goal? Start, you have two minutes. That's a great point. When I came into the Sheriff's Office, we had about just under 13% females, for example. Now we're down to about 11%. And there's a reason for that, I look into it. I'm not going to bore you the details, but there's a legitimate reason for that. But we have to be a more, we have to represent the community better. We have to be a mirror of the community. So I did several things. I got the Civil Service Commission, Civil Service Unit in King County to change their rules. So I can give an extra 10% on a civil service test to anybody that speaks a second language. We've got 170 languages spoken in King County. That's going to be critical. I changed the civil service rules so if you serve two years in the Peace Corps, get an extra 10% on your civil service test. I changed the requirements for entry-level women who were failing the entry-level test at a huge rate, 40% compared to 17% for men. That allows us to work with them before they get to the academy. They've got to take that second test and allows us to make sure they pass that test. And since I've done that, no female has failed the physical ability test at the academy. Right now, among major sheriff's offices in the state of Washington, we have the highest percentage of females of every any sheriff's office. It's a major sheriff's office, twice as much as Spokane, for example. We're doing all the right things. But more importantly, because my hands are tied by civil service, it's who I have promoted. 67% of my division chiefs are female. 14% of my captains are female, compared to 11% overall. 44% of my contract city police chiefs are female. I appointed the first female to head our SWAT team, which happened to be my opponent. I appointed, I appointed my opponent to be a major at our biggest, most important precinct, because I think we need women in command roles in the sheriff's office, and I've done that. share this one. I think that might be best. We have to recognize that there's no cookie cutter approach to how we change the diversity in the sheriff's office. We need to be in touch with communities of, color, of different cultures to ensure that we work with them to identify the barriers that are keeping those folks from wanting to be in, in law enforcement or wanting them to come to the sheriff's office. It's very key, and as I've been talking, for example, with the Vietnamese community, they have great ideas to overcome the barriers to having youth come in to the sheriff's office. As an example, we only have two peop Vietnamese people in our sheriff's office right now. One's a detective and one's an amazing community service officer serving uh, in White Center area. So. That's the first part. We have to build genuine leaderships with community so that they trust us and, and are willing to, to have their kids become, or for they themselves to become uh, deputies in our organization. We need, to, we need to listen to the community, like I said. Um, we have, probably, as of May 31st, 11% women in the, in the organization. Uh, since that time, we're, we're at 7%, since we're talking about women in the organization. While there's good women in leadership, I'm, and I am one of those, we still have few in deputy, sergeant, and captain's ranks. And, and my opponent has, has put people in place saying, for example, with women saying, a woman needs to be in that place. She's the only one that can handle it. Or I need you to go work in the viper pit 
which is a place in our uh, organization uh, that has mostly women. Um, moving on to uh, a couple of um, issues that I think voters are, are curious about. Um, what, what needs to happen to make encounters with um, people who are using drugs or people with mental illness safer for officers, for those individuals, and for bystanders? Bystanders. Um, I think actually it's kind of a if I have that one right. Sorry, uh, what needs to happen uh, to make encounters with drug users or people with mental illness safer for officers, the individuals themselves, and for bystanders? You have two minutes. Thank you. So this goes back to, again, training. We need to ensure that our deputies have the most current in-service, in-person training on how to de-escalate and how to, to intervene in crisis and people in crisis. It's important that we are compassionate and understanding and that our deputies approach it from that angle whenever possible. We also need to have less lethal options for people in crisis who don't want to, uh, that are uh, at harm to themselves or others, I guess is a good way of putting it. And so um, John talked about using beanbag shotguns and those kinds of things. So there's there's a variety of things we need to do for law enforcement um, to include working with providers of services, doing partnerships, private public partnerships with uh, folks that provide mental health facilities and other uh, uh, drug dependency places uh, where we can have folks get into treatment quickly uh, as they identify for themselves that they're ready to go into treatment. <laughs> I just wondered. Okay, here's the biggest thing right now. We have got to quit treating drug issues as a crime. Some of them are crimes, but primarily drug addiction is a health problem. We have fought the war. I was a, a foot soldier on the war on crime, a war on drugs for 20 years, and it was an abject failure. We've got to look for other things if we are going to be successful, because if you go down to the courthouse where I work, it's, it's a vast wasteland of people on drugs, addicted to heroin, and having mental issues. We've got to change our approach. One of the things that I did when I became sheriff was sign up for the LEAD program, Law, Law, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. And that means rather than taking somebody to jail that we come across on the street that's addicted to drugs, that may have possessed some drugs, we take them immediately to treatment where they can talk to a counselor and perhaps get housing, perhaps get into treatment. Law enforcement assisted diversion. It started in Seattle, started in downtown Seattle with the Seattle Police Department and the King County Sheriff's Office. Now it's gone nationwide and it works. And that's a new approach. And I'm gonna bring up something that you're not gonna to wanna to hear, and that's safe injection sites. But I can tell you, there will never be a safe injection site in Bellevue or Redmond or Kirkland or Federal Way or any place else outside Seattle. And after 20 years, and 40 years as a police officer, I hate safe injection sites. I think it's a terrible idea. But the alternative is people are going to die. People are dying right outside my office. So if the city of Seattle wants to put a safe injection site in Pioneer Square, I say more power to them if they make that decision. I am not going to fight that because what we have done for the last 70 years fighting the war on drugs has been a failure. And we have to try new things. And I think. We just have to. Um, in, in light of the devastation we've seen in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey, we're really going to take a, a totally different tack now. Um, we have possibility for seismic activity in this area. Law enforcement plays a part in the event of any major disaster or regional emergency. You know, could 
Could both of you comment on the Sheriff's Department's disaster preparations and training? Are they sufficient? Um, what would you do to make them better? They're not sufficient. None of our training is sufficient right now because there's no money. We get cut every single year. I had to browbeat Dow Constantine to get 800000 800, for the training we needed to quit killing people. But we do work with the King County's Office of Emergency Management on a regular basis. I've got people assigned there. And so we do have plans. King County has plans. But it's going to be more. We are going to, when the, when the big one hits, the police are going to be the primary responder, police and fire, and probably mainly police, for a long, long time. So we have to be more ready. We have to have more equipment. We have to have more training. We have to be more ready than we already are. But until the funding comes through for that, it's going to be a, it's going to be a problem. But we do talk about it. We do train for it. We're all ICS Incident Command trained all the way through. There's a lot that we've done already. But it's clearly not going to be enough when that happens. So when I was captain in special operations, I was actually the person that sat in the Office of Emergency Management in, in the building out in Renton and coordinated with them Sheriff's Office resources. Back in, uh, during the Nisqually earthquake, I was in the courthouse where the communications center used to be, which is now the jury room, and made sure that our call receivers and dispatchers got out to our other outside uh, sites where we had backup 911 centers. And then I stayed in the, in the comm center to answer our non-emergency line that didn't ring through until uh, the courthouse was safe again. So I've been in, in crisis. I was in the uh, Office of Emergency Management uh, during the 2006 and 2007 big storms we had that created flooding and a bunch of other things. I've commanded our Marine unit. I've commanded our air support unit. I've, I've touched every part of King County, worked everywhere, and done every job. We, to my knowledge, it would be nice to know who's working there other than our communications center now with the Office of Emergency Management. Would also be nice to know uh, when they receive training to work with the Office of Emergency Management. So what I intend to do is fairly simple. It becomes an ancillary duty for commanders to rotate through and work with Office of Emergency Management when crisis happens. Because frankly, in an earthquake, bridges are going to be down, roadways are going to be down, and we're going to be isolated wherever we are at that time. I think where I'd put the funding is in our air support unit, because they're going to be critical to get off the ground and get places where, where the cops can't in their vehicles. So that's what I would do. Great. Thank you both so much. That concludes the sheriff's portion of our forum. Um, I'd like to invite the candidates for um, port commissioner to come take their seats. I think we have some more chairs, and we'll set those up for you. Thank you so much, Mitzi Johannes-Nick and Sheriff John Urquhart. All right. I think we're going to gather around and get started. Um, before we start, I just want to apologize for um, the, the questions in the last forum. There was a series of miscommunications and, and mistakes on our part. Um, and I sincerely apologize. I'm very, very sorry if you had a question to ask and you didn't get a chance to ask it. Um, that said, I just want to make a couple things clear. Um, if you could, um, the way we're going to ask these questions, even the ones that are posed by the audience, um, every single candidate is going to have a chance to answer them. So just keep that in mind. Um, you might have something that's really specific, but if you can just have that in mind, I'd really appreciate it. Um, Another thing is make sure you hold them up really high, wave them around. If I see you, I'll try to point to you and, and get someone directed, and I'll try to keep a better eye out for that. And like I said, I'm, I sincerely apologize. Try to get some more audience questions on this forum. Um, with that, we'll turn to um, Port of Seattle Commission. There are three positions uh, in the running this year. Position one, we have Ryan Calkins and John Creighton. 
Um, for position three, we have um, Ahmed Abdi and Stephanie Bowman. For position four, Priti Sridhar and Peter Steinbrook are here with us today. Um, as I said, each question will be answered by every candidate. Remember, candidates, you do have a challenge card. Just a quick note for you guys, your challenge card will apply to your direct opponent only. So, just in case there was any confusion. Um, but same rules apply. You can, after everyone has spoken, you can challenge something that your opponent said, state your challenge, the opponent will have a chance to respond. Um, think that's everything I need. Once again, I'm going to try and vary up the order. If I make a mistake, I apologize. Six people is a lot to keep track of. Um, but with that, um, if I could have each of you take one minute to tell us why you're running for Port of Seattle Commissioner, and in this case, we'll go right down the line, starting with Ryan Calkins. So I'm Ryan Calkins, and I'm running for the Port of Seattle Commission on three key issues, uh, transparency in government, environmental justice, and uh, equity in our economy. I'm John Creighton. I'm the incumbent in position one, and I'm running for re-election. Um, and I want first, I want to thank the league for having a port commission forum. This position flies under, under the radar. A lot of people in the county don't know much about it, but it's such a critical economic engine for our region that I really appreciate you all having this forum. And number two, having the forum on the east side. We were talking about this at an earlier uh, port commission forum this afternoon. But even though we're called the Port of Seattle, we're really the Port of King County. And a lot, not a lot of people know that. And I'm a proud East Sider. I grew up in Bellevue, went to Interlake High School just up the road. My sister, oldest sister, got married right next door at Robinswood Park. And I've worked to make sure that the prosperity created by the port is shared across King County. My name is Ahmed Abdi. Thank you so much for having us today here. Um, I do appreciate. And I and my family live in King County, particularly Seattle, and I have been here for the past, uh, since 2010. I have worked on Proposition 1, at, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Proposition 1 that raised the minimum wage to 15 in SeaTac. And during that time when I was working as an organizer with one of the organizations that was putting together the Prop 1, I realized that mo most of the people who lived there in uh, nearby uh, the port, such as Burien, SeaTac, and who are working there, especially the low-wage workers, had really rough time in, in actually providing their families. And when they stood up and said that we, we won the minimum wage to be 15, the first opposition that we had was the Port of Seattle. That's why I'm running and I wanna make that the difference. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Stephanie Bowman. I am actually only the fifth woman to serve on the Port of Seattle in its 106 year history. I'm proud of that and I'm proud to be running for re-election. The reason that I'm running for re-election is I actually love the port. I love the economic engine that it is, the investments that it makes, that business can't make, that other public agencies can't make. And the reason we do that is so that we have a middle class in this region, so that everybody has economic opportunity. That's why I'm running. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Preeti Sridhar. And uh, I have worked in public service for 25 years, the last 10 years with the city of Renton and 15 years before that for the city of Seattle. Uh, the, as uh, the other candidates have mentioned, the economic engine that the port is is extremely important. Its contribution to our region is in the billions of dollars. And I want to bring my experience in economic development, in environmental sustainability, and in inclusion to make sure that the port works for all of us. And in that, I also want to be accountable to you personally. I think one of the most important things is to have integrity, transparency, and accountability. Um, and I want to make these my priority um, to take the port into the next century and to have a vision for the future for the port that meets your goals. Thank you, Preeti, my co-candidate. And thank you, League of Women Voters. I'm Peter Steinbrook. Uh, you may know me from my past uh, public service and office of Seattle City Council for 10 years. I come from a family of civic activists, most notably my family's efforts to save the Pike Place Market in the 60s. That's where I learned my civics lessons. I've been a passionate advocate for social justice, environmental causes, and I have been a leader 
uh, with great record of accomplishment. I want to bring good jobs to the port, extend the opportunity deep into the communities throughout King County, continue the progress, but we can do a lot more to share the equity and the benefits of a high paying family wage jobs. I want to green the port. It has the largest environmental footprint of anywhere and in the region. And it, un, disproportionately, the impacts of SeaTac Airport, air pollution, fine particulate matter, noise are impacting communities of color and low income communities. And we can do a lot more to increase the commitment there and to make real progress. And finally, I want to bring good governance to the port with my leadership experience. It's unmatched here uh, with the exception of, um, I would say, John, who served for 10, 12 years now on the commission. I serve 10, but I have a lifetime of civic activism, community involvement, and passion, Thank which you. is why the Municipal League rated me outstanding. Thank you. Candidate Steinbrook. Um, got one more introductory question, and I think we'll start uh, with Candidate Creighton, and we'll go round and around. Um, what are the three most pressing issues facing the Port of Seattle in the next five years? Of those issues, which is most critical, and as a commissioner, what action or change would you propose to positively affect that issue? Each candidate will have three minutes. Um, I could probably do a dissertation. The port is a large, complex organization, uh, and we have so many balls in the air. But I, number one, managing growth of the airport. Number two, maintaining a competitive. And number three, as the baby boom generation ages out, making sure that we have the trained workforce to handle all these port jobs. You know, we, the port, we've set a goal to create 100,000 new port-related jobs for our region. And I want to make sure that local youth are getting those jobs. And these are good paying jobs. Um, you know, not everyone wants to go to college or is meant to go to college. You can make $70,000 as a welder, $250,000 as a crane operator. These are good paying jobs that we need to anchor in our region. And so I think, um, you know, number one, making sure where the port is working with local workforce development organizations to make sure we have the trained workforce for the future. Number two, with respect to our airport, as Peter mentioned, you know, we're just growing like gangbusters, but we're putting a lot of pressure and strain on the communities around the airport. And I, I wanna make sure that we're growing responsibly. And as we're growing and creating jobs at the airport and serving the public, the traveling public, that we're also doing right by the, those communities. And then three, with respect to seaport competitiveness, I'm really proud that I was part of the commission that brought the Port of Tacoma and Port of Seattle together. And we're winning back cargo and winning back jobs collectively for our entire Puget Sound, our entire two harbors. Um, but we're not out of the woods yet. And I believe I have the experience and the relationships to continue the port on the right direction. So um, when we talk about port and uh, the economic value that it has in our region, uh, we most often talk about um, the you know, uh, one side of, of, the, of the port. And we more often forget about uh, and how much impact that it has on the airport side, how much impact that it has the people who live in and around the port, uh, in and around the, uh, the airport. So. One, one, one of the challenges that we have right, right, right now is that uh, we have passed a, a wage that is 15, but unfortunately, the port has not taken a leadership role in terms of enforcing the, the, the minimum wage that we have at the airport. And when the port, especially the commissioners are asked why, and they say that it's not, we are not responsible and we don't care about uh, the enforcement part. So. What we have, what we are seeing right now, are folks who are on the bottom that are suffering more, are denied the back page, uh, the back wage that they they deserved, no enforcement, and companies who violate uh, the the labor standard are still rewarded uh, with the extension of uh, uh, the contract. So, one of my, my, the priority I I believe is is first of all to bring leadership into and uh, making sure that that we all the port represents everybody equally not only one part it represents everybody equally addresses the issue of inequality uh, addresses the mo people who are mostly impacted by the port and in and as economic region as well as its pollution and 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 unfortunately we have seen in the past where port commissioners 
and especially my opponent has, you know, and helped and and voted in for the Shell platform in our region. Uh, when, and and when we look at that and how it could impact our our lives, that that's really serious. We we need to have a leadership that addresses environment as a priority, as well as wage uh, enforcement, all these as a priority. The other things the port has neglected in in terms of uh, and putting the priority as inclusiveness. So the port does not listen to the people who elect, especially the co commissioners, people who elect them. So they, when they go there, they only have uh, big corporations such as Alaska and, and, and many other more. So I think we need to end that. The port commissioners are people who are come to you and ask for vote. So they, they need to be held accountable. It has never been the case. I think we need to do that. And those are the things that I want to address. I want to bring the port into the community, not the community running up the, the port, but the port bringing into the community. Thank you. I think the question was about the three most pressing issues in front of the port. So uh, I agree with Commissioner Creighton. Really, the sustainable growth of SeaTac Airport is absolutely critical. It is the ninth busiest airport in the country. We currently process 45 million passengers through SeaTac Airport. Think about the impact of 45 million people coming in and out of SeaTac every year. The environmental footprint is huge. One of the ways that we can address that is improving light rail access to the airport, which is an issue that I've been a big champion on in my four years on the commission. Another thing is bringing aviation biofuels to the airport. The single probably most important thing that we can do to reduce the carbon footprint at the airport is bringing in aviation biofuels. Third is making sure that the impact on the airport communities is not as bad as it is right now. And so to that end, what I'm talking about these days is actually talking about a new regional airport authority. We have to start thinking about moving the impact of SeaTac and maybe spreading that to Painfield or another airport, but it's got to be done in a way that we did with the Seaport Alliance so that it's a coordinated effort that we're not abandoning SeaTac, but we're making sure that the investments made by the public are shared equally and the, and the impact of the airports are shared equally by the communities. Secondly, um, we need to make sure that we're doing the workforce training. Commissioner Creighton mentioned that. That's a big issue for me. My um, four years at the airport, probably one of, or at the port, one of the things I'm most proud of is tripling the amount of interns that we've had at the port. I'm a little embarrassed to say what the number was when I started, but we now have over 150 interns. We're providing great opportunities for youth to learn about jobs and career paths for them to be able to move forward. And third, I'd say in terms of the most pressing issue is making sure that we have ethical leadership moving forward. We are a public agency. And to that end, um, in case you haven't heard, we've changed the description for the new leader at the port to executive director instead of CEO, which is what it has been in the past. That was a purposeful move to um, show that the next leader is leading a public agency that is responsible to the residents of King County and is not leading a corporation. Um, I agree with uh, both Commissioner Creighton and uh, Commissioner Bowman that uh, the three most important factors uh, that are uh, concerning the port right now are managing growth at the airport, uh, making sure that we have plans that are laid out for uh, career pathways to be developed with workforce training, and also to make sure that we keep our marine terminals competitive. Um, in terms of the growth at the airport, uh, yeah, the numbers are staggering. We're looking at 20 million passengers more that will be coming in. Um, and uh, as, that, as we manage that growth, we have to manage the environmental impact of that growth. Um, uh, and the second thing is we have to include our communities and inform them and involve them in the decisions regarding the growth. That's one thing I think the port has not been as open and transparent as it can be. Um, and, and we need to make that happen. For example, there are efforts that are underway right now which are actually right on target. They're looking at expanding the gates for the international terminal so that we can accommodate the wide body jets. Um, and the, the look into the future of getting uh, sustainable biofuel is really the thing we should be doing. It has not only a, a direct impact on uh, climate change and reducing carbon 
um, uh, the emissions, but it actually helps the pollution of the airport communities around. Um, and, and finally, definitely not the least, we have to have a more accountable, open, transparent port. Uh, the decision to have a new executive director um, and the process that the port has undertaken so far to get community input into determining the key uh, accountable factors that would you know, make this person the right fit is all in the right direction, but it has to continue and that accountability has to be really part of the DNA of the port. Well, there's a real advantage to coming last here in a lineup of, of eight. Almost. Uh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Does, who did we miss here? Well, you Oh, can. Ryan. Okay. Yeah. Well, let me get started here. Well, I agree with many of the, the comments, pre the preceding comments. Um, but, and there are a lot of issues, not just three. But I think look at the strategic long-term goals of the port, very ambitious century agenda. Great challenges, but great opportunities as well. Airport expansion is critical to our regional statewide economy, and I agree that we need to begin the siting studies necessary for a future second regional airport. I think that's probably at the top of the list in the long term um, for, uh, the, for what, what, what uh, we face there, as well as addressing now the environmental impacts that are growing with all of the increased flights in and out of the airport. It's really hard on those local communities in South King County, and it's getting worse, and which is uh, why we need to focus more attention on the environmental footprint of the port. Um, I uh, also believe that the cargo uh, and maritime operations are going through some major changes. They're long-term, they're global. Uh, ships are consolidating the freight into larger and larger vessels now, as many as 15,000 uh, TEUs, a 20-foot equivalent units of cargo. This is, this is huge. Some of you may have seen the Ben Franklin in the port. It, it's enormous. It means fewer ships and bigger ships. Uh, so we really need to look at all those facilities and see how to make the most efficient, consolidated use of them. To remain competitive, though, we've got to have freight mobility. Soto has been under assault from speculative land developers for too long. That needs to change. We need to put a stop to that. We need to put jobs, the economy, our economic engine first over uh, recreational uses that have other places to go. And we shouldn't be spending port dollars on recreational uh, facilities either, which had been proposed a while back. Lastly, I think I have to say, uh, this is not a criticism of any of the current port uh, uh, commission members, but I remember Benita Caminelli, some of you remember, and Port Watch going back 30 years. I've been a port watcher at least that long, and, a, and an advocate and an enthusiast for the port. But we absolutely have to restore public confidence and trust in the institution. And for the taxpayers to continue to support uh, the, the levy lift, there's got to be uh, more transparency, accountability, and clear financial management that is on track. That is, and so I want to steer that ship. The very first uh, need there is to hire a new executive director, and it used to be called that. If you go back far enough, then somebody changed it. Maybe it was Nick Dinsmore. I don't know. Uh, but we've got to have the kind of top management leadership there that understands the public mission of the port and to be held accountable to the port commissioners every single day of their job, hers or Thank his. You. So that's what I want to do. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right. All the way to the end here. How the port contributes to climate change. Also, considering ways in which the port is mitigating against the effects of climate change. This is an absolutely critical issue for us. For instance, because Seattle, because our region is a climate refuge, a place where the weather will be reasonable when it gets unlivable in areas south of here, we're going to see a lot of. Uh, and so we need to understand that that in migration, that population growth is going to be something we experience now for the next generation. What are we doing at SeaTac, at the Port of Seattle, 
to accommodate those new residents. Uh, the other thing that I think we need to be looking at is infrastructure, both at the port specifically and in the region generally. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about the Ballard Locks, which is not a port facility. It's a federal government uh, facility run by the US Army Corps of Engineers. Unfortunately, because of the deadlock in DC, we are not getting the kind of funding we need for the Ballard Locks. And yet, were that to fail as a result of a climate change, weather crisis, or because of an earthquake, uh, the loss of that water level in Lake Union and Lake Washington would be catastrophic for our economy. Imagine the water level dropping 9 to 12 feet in less than a week and what that would do to our floating bridges. They could potentially detach and we would not have that transportation across the lake. And, of course, all of the lakefront property loses that economic value. Uh, so we need to be thinking right now, how do we fund the $60 million in deferred maintenance at Ballard Locks? Can we do it regionally and not rely on the federal government and make that our asset here? Uh, so I think there's a lot of things for us to consider. I think our, the panel of candidates is, has addressed a lot of those. And I think we need to be making those generational decisions now. All right. Um, just a quick announcement for candidates. If you could hold the mic closer than you think you need to hold it. Hopefully that will help with our sound. We're trying to work it out here. Um, I have a couple of questions from audience members. Um, candidates will each have two minutes. Um, for this first one, we'll start with candidate Abdi. First question is, what actions can the port take to assure safety of increasing oil to train traffic? Two minutes. So uh, I, I know when, it, when, it, when we talk about environment, uh, oil, and all uh, the, the, the the existing things are the main issue that contributes to uh, the bad uh, environmental uh, that we're talking about right now. I think, uh, you know, even though that we knew that the transportation of oil has been a big problem in, in, in the port and in, in, in our region, and yet, um, you know, we went as far as trying even to and uh, bring the oil shell oil rig uh, platform into our region and and voted for that matter so i think uh, we need to revisit in terms of uh, when it comes to oil and transportation and how we do it and we ought to do in a way that and uh, and find other ways that we could uh, do it rather than actually and uh, using and uh, the trains and and uh, the current uh, and, 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 and transportation that exists. Unfortunately, one thing that has been true is that we have not listened to, uh, the port has not been enough listening to uh, and the environmental groups that were really addressing these issues. And, and, and I think we need to, uh, to include the, the, the environmental groups uh, into a way in which that they can provide an expertise and, and how best that we can provide and uh, safety transportation and and, and ultimately and uh, we we need to get rid of that i mean it's it's really a problem and when you look at the and uh, how the, our environment is changing and how it has been changing and those are the things that we, we we really need to address and and i will be more than happy to and um, be on the right side in terms of addressing those issues and making sure that we take a positive and action and, and responding to any kind of problems that comes with along with the, with the oil and transportation. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I actually have a lot of experience with this issue because those of you may remember last year, about a year ago, the Mosier oil spill. A few folks remember? I was actually um, the number three person on the scene at the Mosier oil spill because I have a place out there. I actually helped evacuate the elementary school in Mosier when um, the fire started. I was there for about 14 hours as the oil train burned. I was later asked by Senator Maria Cantwell to speak to the Senate Energy Committee about what can be done about oil train safety. So from my firsthand experience, I can give you a couple of things that the port can do. First of all, during the Mosier oil spill, I actually directed the Port of Seattle fire crew to be back up to the Port of Portland so that they could come out to Mosier, Oregon and be the fire crew on site. What I learned about that experience is that the fire um, 
fire departments, and most importantly, the railroads do not have adequate resources throughout their transportation network to address oil trains. They address the spills, but they don't address oil train fires. What you need to address an oil train fire is crash trucks, basically foam, not water. They do not have enough crash trucks around. And so that's the number one thing that needs to happen is that the federal government, Congress, needs to require that the, um, the railroads have crash trucks located, and my suggestion is no, no more than 40 um, miles from any community that an oil train goes through. Number two, we need to work with a bunch of all the communities along the tracks to make sure we have a coordinated response when there is an incident. There hasn't been a good enough opportunity to do that. The Port of Seattle is in a unique position because our fire department is trained for big crashes like that. They are trained for petroleum crashes for airplanes. So we have a key role to play in being a leader to train the other um, departments. Um, thank you. Um, if only, if only we could stop our dependence on fossil fuels and oil. And unfortunately, um, this is not going to happen. We've had this hundred years of dependence. And as an unfortunate result, you see the, tra the railroads, the trains with the coal, you know, going through our ports. Um, so this is one of those things that um, if we could... If I could turn the switch off and end this, that would be the highest level of safety and it would be the highest uh, level of us moving forward to clean energy, to a source of, you know, really doing things that are, uh, that are right for the environment. But uh, short of that, continuing to have a very, very strong environmental agenda for the port, following through with everything that we need to um, to get this dependency both for the port as well as working with the environmental community to get that dependence off for our entire region. And then to work really hard at the safety measures. What uh, Commissioner Bowman just men mentioned, that they don't have the foam needed, the railroads, that's shocking. Because I come from a city where all our firefighters have that as one of the things in the event of a large fire. So we have to work with the communities that are creating these issues as well as the communities around so that we you know, protect the safety of all. Um, but I will again end with, if only, let's all work towards that future of clean energy and make it part of our lifetime. Could I have a point of clarification? Was this strictly tied to the shipment or the transfer of petroleum products, coal, it oil, says, or in general. It only sure safety of increasing oil that, trains. That's what I, oh, oil general. trains. Did you say oil? Okay. Yes. Because there's a lot of safety issues. There's pedestrian deaths that happen every year, and including in the Soto district. There's a, a huge volume of rail traffic in and out of the urban areas, up and down the coast. Uh, lots of safety issues. I don't think that the railroad, however, intends to be an unsafe operation. I think they want to avoid it, but there, there are expediencies. They shouldn't be autonomous either. Local land use laws can govern some of the issues having to do with keeping the, the um, coal cars covered so that the dust doesn't escape in the urban areas and, and that they're wetted down. There are various things like that that can be done that are direct um, uh, efforts uh, to curb uh, the health risk um, with re as we know, it's governed by, uh, inter by the state intercommerce in terms of rail traffic. So we don't have real direct authority there. But we do over local land use laws. And where my intergovernmental experience comes in, will come in very handy with the city of Seattle, with King County, with the state, to look to use the strongest means possible uh, to ensure um, safe conditions as these uh, rail cars carrying coal, oil, other hazardous materials through our urban areas are doing everything possible to protect um, the communities that they pass through. And that takes some uh, work, that takes some effort um, and communication and cooperation with, with the, uh, the rail um, road industry. And I think at the, state, at the federal level where we see um, holes, weaknesses, we need to lobby more to bring better safety standards uh, to the, the management and operations of, of freight and, um, and the shipment of coal. So those are the things that I would do. 
I would also be concerned about some of the other me me things I mentioned, where the the the, uh, the, the, um, the the rail cars are moving through slide-prone areas. Well, those could be real safety issues as well, uh, and those are local issues. So I Thank think you. it's cooperation, negotiation, and, and slide advocacy. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for the question. I think this is a, a it taps into one of the essential uh, obligations of the Port of Seattle Commission, which is to be good caretakers of our environment locally and to the extent that as a public agency we can impact global effect, effects of climate change. That's our obligation as well. Um, to be clear, uh, the Port of Seattle does not have much jurisdiction over these coal and oil trains that are going through our communities. And so we do, as a commission, have a limited ability to impact that. <coughs> However, there are a few things we can do. The first is, I would suggest, and, and uh, as a commission, I would urge us to sign on to Sightline Institute, which is a local environmental think tank, their proposal for a thin green line, which is essentially the linking of West Coast ports to say none of us will transport the dirtiest of fossil fuels, the oil sands, the coal coming out of the uh, of the center of the country and just say, it will stop at the waterfront and we won't export it. And that will help us to prevent future burning of fossil fuels. The other thing I think we need to think about is why is this happening in the first place? Why are we using oil in our economy instead of renewables? A part of it is because the negative externalities of fossil fuels are not priced into the cost. And we as public agencies need to recognize those costs and charge for them so that our, the dirty air and dirty water that citizens of the United States have to deal with because of fossil fuel practices that pollute, those companies are not having to pay those prices. And we need to find ways to charge that as a part of the economy. If you do that, then all of a sudden, coal and oil are no longer competitive against solar and other renewables. And you don't need the policy changes. You simply let the market take over. And so I think at the Port of Seattle, we have opportunities to do that. We have a public agency that's large enough to electrify our vehicle fleets, and we can proceed with those things. Well, thank you for the question, a really good question. And batting cleanup on this question, I have to say I agree with most of uh, what's been said so far. I'll just add a couple points. Uh, number one, uh, Commissioner Bowman mentioned at the federal level, a lot of good legislation can and should and actually has been passed in the last couple of years at the state level. Unfortunately, one of the biggest champions on this issue, Justin Farrell, stepped down to run for mayor. And so we've lost her in the legislature. But there's other, other good champions that the poor should be working with at the state level on this issue. Uh, second, I'll say it's not only an issue of safety, which is critical for our community, but it's an issue of competitiveness and jobs for the Port of Seattle. We don't run an oil terminal. We don't run a coal terminal. We run container terminals. We run cargo terminals. And at the height of a, the oil train number has actually decreased a little bit in the last few years. But a few years ago, at the height of the oil sands operations in North Dakota and Alberta, those trains were clogging up the tracks uh, that we use to transport cargo. So it's an issue of competitiveness for the Port of Seattle to have those oil trains on our tracks, the same tracks that serve uh, cargo trains. So that's a big issue that the Port Commission needs to watch. And then secondly, I, I agree with, um, Ryan's mentioned it, Stephanie also mentioned it, in terms of the Port has a real leadership role to help move the region. You know, the Port, we build infrastructure that serves trucks, trains, ships, um, what am I missing, airplanes, all these big machinery. <laughs> All this big machinery that operates off carbon. But we have a real opportunity and a real role to play in helping move the region, helping move the industry, helping move the world to post-carbon economy and things like aviation biofuels and things like shore power at the, the ter terminals and whatnot. Great. And you had a challenge, uh, yeah. Canada, up to you at 45 seconds. And then, uh, uh, Commissioner Bowman, you'll have 45 seconds to respond. Great. So everybody says that, yes, it's a problem. The environment has, uh, and, uh, and oil has env environmental uh, impact in our, in our region. And, uh, and it's unfortunate that that uh, my opponent has suggested some of the solutions that she thought that uh, could help. And she has been there for six years. 
and none of those solutions were brought to the table. And the other thing is also, and 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 if in the in the in the past you have not shown a leadership role in terms of saying no to oil shell platform in our region, what makes us you know or what 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 do we think that will make you different at this time when it, we when we really need a solution to the problems that currently exist? Environmental issue is a big problem. We need right. a strong relationship. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So a um, couple of corrections. I've been on the Port Commission for four years, and I do believe actually that I have had a big leadership role. And I want to also um, commend Commissioner Creighton for this, as well as the two of us were the ones to really push for bio aviation biofuels at the airport. Um, and again, I'll just harken back to being called by Senator Cantwell to testify at a, a U.S. Senate Energy Committee on oil train safety is a big deal. I think I've been seen as a leader on this issue throughout the region. It's something that I care very deeply about. All right, this next question also comes from the audience. Each candidate will have one minute. Commissioner Bowman, we'll start with you. Um, they ask, what is your plan to utilize the empty terminal by the West Seattle Bridge? What are the possibilities? One minute. Oh, that's an easy one. So the terminal is referred to as Terminal 5. It is currently empty because it's being renovated. Terminal 5 is actually the single best terminal in the Pacific Northwest, not just Washington State, the Pacific Northwest, because of its layout, because of on-dock rail, because of its, um, its uh, nearness to our main lines, both the Union Pacific and the Burlington Northern. What's happening with the um, terminal right now is that we are upgrading the docks, we're deepening the berth, we're upgrading the utility so they can handle the larger cranes, the biggest cranes in the world that can handle the post-Panamax ships. Uh, we need to do that, and at the same time, we're looking for the customer mix that's going to be in there. There are global alliances of carriers, and we're our um, CEO at the Northwest Seaport Alliance is talking with them right now about who is going to be the best customer for Terminal 5. Um, thank you, uh Stephanie, you got all my answers. I will add one more to what she said. Uh, Terminal 5 also has shore power, which is a huge competitive edge. So with the fact that there's a you know, significant uh, uh, renovation that's going on there, it is really one of the most competitive, uh, valuable, and sought-after terminals. And so uh, the port commissioners are working towards, the port is working, the Seaport Alliance together is working to get really the, the best client there, and it's not a matter of if, but it's really a matter of soon and when and get the right. So um, that's that's going to be a, a huge kudos for us and, and really much deserved and keep us competitive in the marine, uh, uh, marine industry. Well, actually, I think it's a perfect place for a casino complex and some high-rise hotels. <laughs> Not, 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 not. No, the T5, Terminal 5, as Commissioner Bowman mentioned, is, going, is one of the port's most important maritime assets for all the reasons she laid out. Deep water port, it can accommodate the world's largest, most advanced uh, container uh, ships, and that is the future of shipping. But we have to remain competitive here locally with other West Coast ports in order to utilize that asset and attract the shippers to want to lease that facility. But I can tell you, it's state of the art and it's one of the best on the West Coast. So we, we have to realize what we have there and really fiercely go after the competition that is global, that is West Coast, uh, British Columbia, Prince Rupert. Uh, we're up against that. The Northwest Seaport was one of the best things I think the port did in recent years to align our uh, Seattle sea, a Seaport with Tacomas and to have a stronger competitive advantage. Thank now you. we've got to make it Thank work. That's, that's Thank you. So Peter sort of stole my thunder there. I was going to propose the, the world's largest uh, beach volleyball court, but uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, no, I, but I... <laughs> I am pleased to hear that uh, there's a consensus that this should remain a container cargo terminal. Uh, I would suggest the only concern is why has it taken so long? We lost the lease to, to APL years ago, and uh, we needed this to be a hair on fire issue for the Port Commission. It's taken us too long to get to the point where we're finally getting the permits to be able to redevelop it in the way that we need it redeveloped to manage these large ships. and so. 
being all in consensus, moving forward with this, I think the question shifts to what is going to happen to Terminal 46, which is currently a container cargo terminal, but may be made obsolete by the redevelopment of Terminal 5 and by the Northwest Seaport Alliance's own admission that they want to move to four container terminals, 18 and, or sorry, 5 and 18 at the Port of Seattle and two in the South Harbor in Tacoma. All right, well, I think, again, a lot has been said, and I think Commissioner Bowman really laid out what makes the Terminal 5 so competitive compared to other terminals up and down the West Coast. But I really have to say, it's not only an asset for Seattle or King County or the region, it really is a statewide asset. It's really, it's even more important to the farmers and exporters in Eastern Washington that they have a competitive gateway to Asia and the rest of the world, even then a lot of the folks around here. And in fact, you go over to Eastern Washington, the farmers and the exports really, exporters really understand the compelling interest of having a competitive terminal. But, you know, Ryan and Peter jest, but, um, you know, the port is such a great economic engine for our region because it's so diversified. And another thing that we do is tourism between our airport and our uh, two cruise terminals. We have a big stake in the tourism economy, and we were actually approached by a famous Seattle rock band about doing a concert on Terminal 5, which I would love to see, but still haven't convinced our Tacoma colleagues that that's a good idea. I think most have been said, and the only issue is, as Ryan said, is the timing. I mean, it's taking long, and, and I don't know what's holding. Um, I think it should be and 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 renovate it and and make it available so that it can be on use so that's the only thing i would add to that commissioner bowman you have a challenge you have 45 seconds to state and then uh canada abdi you have 45 seconds to respond sure i, I just need to correct the record so it, the terminal has been empty for three years and we started getting the permits within about the first nine months so actually it's I know that might seem like a long time but that's actually just the process of going through an EIS and a final EIS and understanding all the components of running a major marine terminal so um, there was no delay in trying to find a customer at all uh, did you have a Okay, fantastic. Um, sorry, I have a couple of questions here. Um, each candidate will have one minute to answer the next question. Um, at the national level, this is another question from the audience, at the national level, uh, there is some anti-trade rhetoric going on, um, may not be good for King County. What role will you take to fight back against that rhetoric? And candidate Sridhar, I believe it's your turn to start. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, trade has been one of the largest contributors uh, to the economic success of our region. Uh, when we look at the Port of uh, Seattle, uh, we're looking at $12 billion that it uh, contributes directly and indirectly into our economy. So this is really important for us, and, and we need to continue to keep that advantage. Um, the trade also brings us jobs. Uh, we've got about 70,000 jobs in the marine industry directly. And again, you know, when you do a multiplier effect, it's much more than that. It's about uh, 1.7 million uh, jobs. The, the average uh, uh, salaries are high in this industry. You're talking, you know, again, $70,000 as an average salary rather than in retail. So we have to fight to keep that competitive edge and, in fact, uh, keep looking at the future to continue to be competitive. It's uh, to the advantage of our region. Okay, well, this is really a huge political question because we have a tyrannical, bigoted, misogynistic, racist, lying SOB and the worst president we've ever no, seen in U.S. history. And he needs to go along with his clan. That might be the KKK as well. So um, that being said, um, trade is not going to stop. We have a very viable uh, trade uh, uh, commerce industry here, and it's not going to stop. It is consumer goods going both ways, agricultural products from eastern Washington, uh, aviation uh, being uh, is one of our largest uh, products uh, going out of the state. This is not going to stop, but we have to push back on this tyrannical administration and stop this nonsense. 
before there's too much more damage is done to our people, our communities, and the country. So I, I think as leaders, elected leaders everywhere, as we've seen here in Washington with Attorney General Bob Ferguson challenging through lawsuits at every turn Thank here, you. that's the kind of action we need to take as principled elected leaders. Thank you. So I'm going to take this opportunity to, to speak about the other part of the movement of goods and people. So we're talking about trade in terms of movement of goods. I want to talk about the movement of people. Uh, in the last couple of days, we've seen what happens when the federal government steps in and rescinds DACA, what that means for the 17,000 residents of the state of Washington who have DACA status right now. The port of Seattle is the welcome mat for our region. We oversee SeaTac Airport, where many of these issues are where the rubber meets the road for many of these issues, we need to declare ourselves a sanctuary port now. We need to do so with concrete actions like establishing a legal defense fund for those who are caught in legal limbo at the airport. The city of Seattle has done that, but SeaTac is under the city of SeaTac jurisdiction. We need one at, at the Port of Seattle as well. And furthermore, we need to instruct the Port of Seattle police not to participate in any federal immigration questioning of detainees, and there are many more issues we can do to be a true sanctuary port. Well, thank you. This is a critical question. The most trade-dependent state in the Union, the only state with a trade surplus with China, trade is our lifeblood. And I believe that with a federal government that doesn't really reflect our values as a region, it's incumbent upon local government to really step up and lead and fill these voids. And I've really been proud of the commission the last six to eight months. When uh, President Trump announced the Muslim ban on a Friday night, all five commissioners were down at the airport on Saturday with the governor, the lieutenant governor, county executive, mayor, all saying, this Muslim ban does not comport with local values and we're gonna push back. When Trump announced that he would pull us out of the Paris Accord, all five commissioners voted to join. We're still in a group of local governments that are recommitting to adhering to the Paris Accords on a local level. And I believe that we should continue to lead and reflect local values, even if they're not being reflected at the federal level. And so I think a lot have been said, and, and, and I agree, you know, the steps that the commission has taken in terms of <laughs> making sure that they voice uh, uh, the issue of um, uh, and and when the Trump uh, has signed an executive order to uh, that could have imp that impacted the Muslim or majority Muslims, and also one thing that I really agree with is what Ryan has said in terms of like making our port uh, a sanctuary port where you know it's people are safe and uh, they are not just being targeted who they are and 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 the name that they carry. That happens to me. I have personal experience all the time when I fly come back. So I'm, I'm personally targeted on that. I think we need to address those issues. And the other thing is um, uh, trade Trade is really big thing for our economy. It's, and we also need to address in terms of how it affects women, right? Like we, there's 4.1 billion uh, that wages come annually as, as a trade, uh, at, uh, trade and uh, through the... Um, uh, and maritimes, but we need to uh, address the issue of wage in terms of women and how much they get, why yeah. women get less than men. Uh, oh, one more. One more. more. I'll, I'll be very quick on this one. Um, so we need to keep our port open to the world. Um, and I was proud to s stand with my colleagues against the Muslim ban. Um, I will say, Ryan, I actually um, proposed the sanctuary port on, I think it was January 23rd. So I'm glad you agree with that, and you too. Um, it's a big deal. We, need, we have the opportunity to stand up to the federal government on these issues. And unfortunately, I think we're being challenged every single day as residents of what more can we do? But the port of Seattle in particular, because of the region that we represent, because of the people that we represent, we can be the vanguard against this administration on all of these issues. All right. I think I have time for about two more questions. So if I didn't get to yours, I apologize. Um, we have received a question about the new basketball arena. So the 
Question is, do you support Chris Hansen's proposal to build a new basketball arena in the Soto area? Um, why or why not? And we'll start with Hannah you have Show of hands, who loves minute. basketball? Who loves uh, the thought, wants to bring them back? Okay, that's not the issue here. <laughs> the issue is we have a land speculator, a greedy one at that, whose intentions go far beyond any kind of a publicly financed arena, um, and to, to, to gentrify, upscale, uh, a good chunk of our Duwamish Manufacturing Industrial Center. We, need to, we, we, we cannot allow that to happen. The jobs are too important. Uh, freight mobility, uh, the, those things need to come first. And we can't allow the erosion of our Manufacturing Industrial Center, the most important center in the state of Washington. We can, get a, we can get a sports arena. That's not the place for it. I don't think the port has a role in deciding where an arena should go, but it certainly can uh, defend and protect uh, the industrial lands that are critical to its basic core function. And that should come first. Jobs come first, Thank you. freight mobility, manufacturing, industrial. We have to protect those lands. So the metric I use for answering this question is what option brings the most good paying jobs to our region? And I have spent more time pouring over studies and some written by our own, very own Peter Steinbrook here, uh, examining this very issue. And I, I don't think it's black and white. I think it's a gray area. I think we need to figure out how as a port commission, we can support an alternative that provides good union jobs to our region for the long term. Uh, I'm not convinced that the Key Arena proposal is any better in that sense. And so at this point, I wouldn't feel comfortable with either. But I, I think unilaterally pulling options off the table and losing the leverage with bidders is a bad idea. I spent 10 years in business working with multiple vendors. And I've learned that if you only have one other person across the table from you, you don't have much leverage. Uh, unfortunately, I think this issue now is moot. It's uh, in the city's court, and they're going to make the decision on it. And I think we, as a port commission, should start focusing on what to do with Terminal 46. All right, well, I'm a huge sports fan, and I remember as a kid on my Seattle Times paper route, when the Seattle Times used to be an evening edition, running home to make sure that I caught the Sonics in the 79 finals. And so I would, and as I mentioned before, the port has a growing role in our tourism economy. So I support bringing the Sonics back to Seattle, back to our area, just not in Soto. You know, I really, um, this proposal has been out there for five years, and I really, really pushed port staff over the years. Come up with a proposal, I don't care how expensive it is, so that, you know, where the port and the arena can live side by side, and they just couldn't come up with, you know, anything that they would come up with would cost half a billion dollars. And so I'm concerned about the gentrification that the Soto <laughs> Arena would cause in Soto. And I think the key arena uh, is a better proposal because that area is already gentrified, already made for that kind of activity. Although I think, as Ryan mentioned, we would be kidding ourselves not to think that there's also traffic issues around key arena that the port needs to help address. I think uh, I have look, looked into this issue and I've seen that, um, you know, carrying a proposal and it, it depends on where the money comes from, right? If, they, if, if it comes from the taxpayer, if it's the taxpayer's money and, uh, and, 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 and you know, that it's going to cost us, I mean, that's one that I am not completely and, and supportive. The other thing is also uh, in terms of congestion and traffic, and as Ryan talked about, uh, and also jobs that's going to create. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really in passionate about uh, union jobs and uh, livable wage jobs and protecting uh, the environment. So unless we address the issues of transportation and, 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 and environment and as well as work, worker rights and, and good jobs, paying jobs, union jobs, I think it will be difficult for me to in, in position myself in supporting the key arena. So we need to address all the the pros and cons in terms of what jobs that it could create, where the money comes from, and and how it affects our and uh, you know mobility and going back Thank and you. forth. I think. 
Well, I'm really clear on this issue. I oppose um, the Soto Arena. Um, I don't think that's the right place for an arena. Arena can go a lot of other places in this region. Um, Peter touched on part of it, but I want to take it a step further. He talked about the importance of the manufacturing and industrial center that Soto is. It's critically important, but I want to talk about the why. Why is it important? Because it means that we have a middle class in the city of Seattle. It means that you can work in a manufacturing job and make $65,000 a year and still live in the city of Seattle. It means we have economic diversity, that it's not all about a high-tech industry and the people that serve them. And that's why I oppose anything down in Soto and keeping that manufacturing industrial base so that we have economic diversity for everybody. You can have an arena anywhere, but you can have a deep water port only where it is. So that's really my answer. Having said that, I want to take this opportunity to also say I really believe in the value of a sports team. I am the liaison to the Seahawks, and I have a picture here with me and Doug Baldwin. But the reason I bring it, you can come and see it. The reason I bring it up is it's important to have a sports team. Uh, among other things, there's a lot of charity that they bring to the uh, to the region. The the uh, the project I'm working with on Doug Baldwin is to build a community center for uh, less privileged kids in Renton. Um, but let's find another spot for the arena. The Soto Arena is not the Soto is not the place for the arena. All right, and I have one last question, and we'll start back at the beginning here. Uh, and this question, once again, comes from the audience, and they say, can the Port Commission put pressure on private airport vendors to pay living wages to comply with the SeaTac minimum wage law? Do you think it should? Have a minute. Great question. Uh, so yes, it can, and it should. And in fact, it, uh, the, the Port of Seattle uh, was party to a lawsuit against the city of SeaTac when city of SeaTac passed the Proposition 1 $15 minimum wage. Had I been on the commission, I would not have been averse to a $15 minimum wage at SeaTac. I believe that's a fair wage. I think we're moving forward in our region with advances in statewide minimum wage, in the city of Seattle's minimum wage. And so I am a proponent of increased minimum wages, and I would not have been party to a lawsuit against it. Uh, just one clarification before I uh, give my answer, but uh, the board commission supported joining the lawsuit because we didn't feel the city of SeaTac should have regulatory authority over a statewide asset, the uh, SeaTac airport, but we did on our own uh, implement our own living wage at SeaTac airport. And we can ensure that the tenants are living up to Proposition 1, and we have done that by writing it into all concessions contracts with the concessionaires that the to comply with their contract, to comply with their lease, they have to pay a minimum wage, they have to comply with Proposition 1. And we have 15 minimum wage in Seattle, and we have Office of Labor Standard that enforces the minimum wage in Seattle. Unfortunately, yes, the Port Commission could have sided on the side of the uh, communities uh, that wanted the voice to be 15, and they didn't do that with, with a bunch of excuses. However, What's most important in terms of enforcement? Yes, the port and especially the commission can play a big role in making sure that the, the 15 minimum wage is enforced. It's also a, a give also opportunity where the, the folks uh, have an office inside the airport. If they have an issue, labor standard violation issues, they could come and, and, and they get someone who helps them. And, and we have the 15 minimum wage. We need those labor, uh, good labor and, and uh, rule uh, regulations that exist and uh, we need to enforce and the port can play a real a, a leadership role and that's what I will do when I become the next commission. Um, so I, to reiterate what Commissioner Creighton said, just to clarify for the record, we not only supported the $15 minimum wage, but actually passed what's called the Quality Jobs Initiative, which oversees all of the concessions at the airport, which goes beyond $15 minimum wage, also includes things like time off, make sure medical benefits, things that weren't included necessarily in SeaTac Proposition 1. I actually work with low-income communities every single day in my day job as the executive director of the Washington Asset Building Coalition. So I know how important it is to have not just a $15 minimum wage, but a living wage. And I'm proud of what the commission has done in the last three years in terms of having that regulatory enforcement over our concessionaires at the airport. Um, 
Absolutely. Uh, we have to uh, make sure that the $15 minimum wage is a standard. The port has a right, an obligation, and an ability to do so, and it has been doing so. There are still some concessioners uh, and uh, some of the smaller businesses that are not in full compliance, and it's uh, for the port to take that leadership to that next level to make sure that it's uh, across the board uh, with the airport. I strongly support the fight for $15 for very low paid, primarily service workers. It's a national movement. We are making progress, but it's slow. There's a lot of other areas of social equity and economic justice that the port can be a leader in. It has a triple bottom line of social, environmental, and economic uh, uh, mission and policy. Uh, what about the port's own employees? When Seattle passed its 15 uh, they discovered that they had a lot of employees that weren't being paid 15. <laughs> and what about equal pay for equal work for women, for example, and opportunity and job ladder, ec uh, per, uh, opportunity to, to, to climb the, the ladder for greater opportunity? What about management positions? What about contracting out? The port contracts millions of dollars a year, and yet it only has 5.5% women and minority-owned businesses that are supported through those contracts. That is a, a, a figure that is not a good scorecard that needs to change. And so I think there are a lot of issues here, social and economic justice issues that the port can strengthen its leadership role. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Senator Calkins, you have a challenge to something Commissioner uh, um, Crichton said? I think the response to this question really goes to how you believe the economy works. I believe the economy works as a percolate up economy. When you serve the needs of the people at the base of the economic pyramid, you generate economic growth, which is the role of the Port of Seattle. It is our mission. If you think that we live in a trickle down economy, it's a different set of policies. But if you think you, we, we live in a percolate up, a bottom up economy, then you support things like an increase to the minimum wage and ensuring that local folks are benefiting from the economic largesse of this port. All right. <laughs> um, so the port was founded in the 19 teens during the progressive era um, to really bring, you know, take back the waterfront for citizens. And I think that's where it has its most value is in cre creating economic prosperity for citizens all across King County. And I've been a champion on that in terms of making sure that port prosperity benefits everyone, that increasing the pipeline for port jobs to underserved communities, and also increasing port contracting with minority and women-owned businesses. And I really think that's the value of what the port can do for our community. All right. Thank you. Thank you, candidates, for coming this evening. <laughs> that concludes. Uh, the last part of our forum. Um. I just wanted to say a few words. I just wanted to say, uh, to repeat earlier, thank you so much, candidates. This is a very grueling process, I know, and then, you know, we put you up here and put you in the spotlight and ask you lots of questions and time you and, you know, poke you and prod you. So we really appreciate you being here. And, and thank you all for coming out. And if you want more information about these candidates, please visit vote411.org. Uh, we have candidate questionnaires. You can see what they've how they've answered our questionnaires, get tailored information based on your address. Um, our address for the League of Women Voters, seattlelwv.org. Thank you for coming out. Hopefully you're informed, enlightened, and can make good decisions on your ballot this fall. Thank you. <laughs>